My name is Mark Schallhammer. I'm the MC for today's event. I'm a white male in my mid-60s, dark hair, a graying beard and mustache and glasses. I'm sitting here in my home office where I'm surrounded by an array of vintage electronic equipment. It's often mistaken for a covert listening post, but I assure you there is no nefarious purpose involved. I direct the Human Spaceflight Lab at Johns Hopkins University and a program we call Bioastronautics at Hopkins that aims to promote human spaceflight, not only here at Johns Hopkins, but at other, other universities and institutions as well. And this is part of a larger umbrella group here called Space at Hopkins. Our efforts are supported by the Office of Research and Translation in the School of Engineering. And today's event is actually run by our partners, Hopkins at Home, which provide video and online promotion and production. This is the sixth of our online events. The first was in February of 2021. And since then, we've had four of these mini symposia on topics of systems medicine in space, statistics, surgery in space, and space radiation. Today's topic is making space accessible for individuals with disabilities. We'll have presentations from two experts in the field, comments from a third speaker with a more focused interest in disability medicine, and then a discussion between them and me, and finally, questions from you, the audience. You can submit written questions online at any time during the presentations. They'll be read to the panel at the end by Malika Sarma, my postdoctoral fellow. Our timing is flexible and will be based on the discussion among the panelists and myself and the questions that we receive. So now on to the topic at hand. Human spaceflight is changing dramatically. We live in exciting times in this field. Commercial spaceflight in particular is changing the paradigm on access to space. The first US astronauts were white male test pilots. This was later exp expanded beyond test pilots but remained a white male endeavor for many years. It was not until the 1978 astronaut class, the eighth NASA group selected, that an African-American, Asian-American, and six women were selected. While NASA has flown astronauts with controlled medical conditions, it has not yet flown people with overt disabilities, at least that we know of. Centrifuge studies con conducted by Jim Vanderplu, Rebecca Blue, and their colleagues have shown that people with a wide range of medical issues can tolerate the G-forces involved in at least a suborbital spaceflight. Stephen Hawking, the famous physicist who had ALS, flew with medical attendants on a parabolic flight with Zero G Corporation in 2007. One of the leading organizations in this area is Astro Access. What they are doing is very impressive, including flying disabled people on parabolic flights. As noted on their website, their goal is to advance disability inclusion in space. On the SpaceX-4 Inspiration flight in September of 2001, Haley Arsenault, a cancer survivor, flew with a prosthetic implant. An individual with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease recently made a suborbital flight with Virgin Galactic. William Shatner made a suborbital flight with Blue Origin at the age of 90. And I, well, I hesitate to say that age itself is a disability, given my own advancing age. I will point out that this certainly expands the domain of people who are able to fly into space, and this trend is likely to continue. I learned to scuba dive when I was in graduate school. The group of people who taught us also taught those with disabilities to scuba dive. They mentioned that being in the water was a great enabler for many of the people with physical disabilities. They could in some ways outperform the non-disabled. It was a great equalizer. One wonders if people who have a different relationship to three-dimensional space or people who have had to constantly overcome disabilities just to navigate in the world might fare better in the novel environment of space. This would be a new form of the right stuff. We're now getting to the point when this hypothesis might be tested with due attention to medical oversight in commercial space flights. Discussions are underway to create the equivalent of a NASA human research program for participants in commercial space flights, which would have as part of its goal to determine how to make space more readily accessible for people with medical issues and with disabilities. 
a few years ago, I used to cross paths with a gentleman who was making the case that people without legs would be ideal astronauts. For one thing, legs are almost useless in space. Astronauts use their arms to get around, and legs can just get in the way, and they carry a metabolic cost. An astronaut without legs would need less food and water, would take up less volume, and would be of less mass. But more than that, one of the physiological problems of being in space for a long time is a shifting of fluids from the lower body to the upper body, which might be one of the contributors to the vision changes that are seen in long duration astronauts. And this could lead to changes in brain structure in the long run. Removing the large reservoir of fluids in the lower body by removing the legs would certainly be a novel approach to the fluid shift problem. So you could might say that such a person would definitely be differently abled rather than disabled. So food for thought. So with that in mind as background, let's move on to our panel. Let me note, first of all, that this is a learning experience for all of us, including the production team at Hopkins at Home and myself. So we have uh, CART captioning, and we have uh, sign language interpreters. This is new for all of us. Things may go wrong while we're doing this. If so, bear with us. We'll get things back in order and, and get back online as soon as we can if there are glitches. So I'm now going to introduce our speakers, all three of them, in reverse order. They will each intru introduce themselves in more detail as, they, uh, as we call upon them to speak. So again, in reverse order, first of all, Bonnie Lynn Sweenor is an associate professor in the School of Nursing here at Johns Hopkins and the founder and director of the Johns Hopkins University Disability Health Research Center. From their website, they aim to shift the paradigm from living with a disability to thriving with a disability and maximize the health equity and participation of people with disabilities. This includes, by the way, increasing access to resources for scientists with disabilities. Sarah Husnane is a software engineer and physicist who serves as a systems integrator and program coordinator and founder and lead of the Human Space Flight Innovation Network at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Her interests include space, space Earth translational innovation, astronautics, disability-centered human factors, AI ethics, and socio-technical impacts. And finally, Dr. Shana Gifford is Associate Professor of Orthopedics and, re and a Rehabilitation Physician for St. Louis University. She's board certified in rehabilitation medic medication medicine, a senior air medical examiner for the FAA, and the head of medical operations for Astro Access, the group that I just talked about a few minutes ago. In fact, it was seeing Dr. Gifford speak at a conference about her participa participation in Astro Access that heightened my interest in, in this topic for reasons I just noted a few minutes ago, and that led us to where we are today. Shana has been a major advocate for reducing barriers to individuals with disabilities in spaceflight and is our first speaker. So Dr. Gifford, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate that introduction. And everybody at home, Thank you for being here. My name is Shana Gifford, she, her, are my pronouns. I am a white female presenting person in a white lab coat. And I'm here today to talk about biomedical considerations for para-astronautics, also known as astronautics for the whole human population. And I hope by the time my talk ends, we'll all be in agreement that basically we're just talking about making space universally accessible because universal accessibility means universal use. And that's what we'd like to see in space. Everyone who wants to go has not just the capability, but the access to do so. Before I begin, I have no disclosures. My opinions are my own, don't represent the United States Air Force, the FAA, Astro Access, my hospital, or the disability community. I speak only for myself. So before I talk about my opinions at all, though, I'd like to get a sense of yours. So for those of us in the room, could you please raise your uh, electronic appendage of choice uh, if you have ever considered sending humans to microgravity or the biomechanical challenges of just being in the microgravity environment 
or to what extent being in the microgravity environment requires high performance. Feel free to flip your hand up, raise your hand, do all those things. And I know there are people on the call who have. Okay, good. So we've many, many people here have considered this and many people watching this recording later will consider this. So my next question is this, to what extent do we define the optimum occupational performance for being in microgravity? How do we define that? Who says what it takes to work in a high, the high stakes environment as an astronaut or as a researcher or as even a tourist? Who sets that standard? And what is that standard set to? And what is that standard based on? And if you don't have the answer to that, that's okay. I don't either. And I've been thinking about these problems for decades. This is in part my job. I'm a physiatrist. And that means I, I care for people who, among other things, have various disabilities, or as I like to think of them, adaptations. All humans are adapted to our respective environments. Some people are adapted differently than others. You propel with a wheelchair, with a wheelchair. you propel with a walker or a cane, you propel with two legs and no assistive device. Either way, you're adapted to your environment and you're propelling through. I'm an aerospace researcher. I've been doing that for the last 27 years. And uh, you know, that's when I started in space design in 1997, doing these, you know, designs for a Mars mission that has yet to occur. And uh, then I became many, many decades later a simulated astronaut. I currently hold the record for a position in a US space simulation, though I hope that will soon be broken. I'm a flight surgeon, so I work for the FAA as well as the US Air Force and think about how to get people into the flight environment and keep them into the flight environment. More to the point, I think about the standards that allow people to function in the aeromedical environment. Function doctor. I think about function and maximizing function for everybody doing every kind of performance in that environment. And to that end, I'm a flight surgeon for aspiring astronauts with disabilities, or as I like to just call them, aspiring astronauts. Yes, some people have impairments. Let's define that for a moment before we get too far down the road. What does it even mean technically to have a disability or an impairment or a handicap? Definition wise, an impairment is a restriction or a lack of standard structure or function. Here on this page, I have pictured the aspiring astronauts from Mission Astro Access 1 on the left, which features four people in wheel who propel with wheelchairs, several people who navigate spaces using various sorts of assistive devices due to adaptations in their vision, and then several people who navigate spaces use and communicate using a very kind of adaptations due to changes in hearing that are a structural or functional change. They have impairments. Sometimes an impairment leads to a disability, which is a restriction to that impairment. Many people have impairments. They have non-standard structural or functional. They may or may not have a restriction. And the restriction is what makes you disabled. If you take nothing else away from this talk, I'd like you to remember that. If you have an impairment, but the environment or tools or resources you've been given allow you to achieve standard function, your disability may essentially be invisible or you know, effectively not in play in your daily function or your work function. And last is handicap. And no shame in the game if this is the first time someone's spelling out the difference between a disability and a handicap. But I'd like you to know that a handicap technically is a disadvantage filling an expected role because of a restriction due to an impairment. If you, have, if you do not have a disadvantage, if the environment doesn't create a disadvantage for you, if you've been given the tools, the resources to function well, you may not be handicapped regardless of disability or impairment. So I wanna emphasize that. I also wanna emphasize that there's a picture from mission two of the wonderful John. John was born a congenital quad amputee. He propels through the environment using a variety of tools, adaptations, prosthetics that replace his upper extremities and lower extremities. And that those are his adaptations. He may or may not have any handicaps. Depends on his expected role. Depends on the environment, right? He definitely has an impairment, a non-standard structure, but his disabilities and handicaps are not dictated to him. They have a lot to do with the environment. Let's talk about the environment now. Here we are in, my, in micro G, where we are playing where there is no field. Uh, Mark set us up nicely to talk about the fact that space eliminates some disabilities, and in fact may give people with some disabilities 
functional advantage. That is indeed true. They talk about a level playing field. Well, there's no level, there's no field. In microgravity, things are very different. And here there are two pictures on the left is me in microgravity. I'm coming out of doing a hamster wheel, meaning I crawled around the interior surface of the zero G plane using only my hands, a trick that was taught to me by my flyers with spinal cord injuries. They can do two of these things in under 30 seconds sometimes. On the right is a picture of CC Lieutenant Mavic. The difference between the two of us, two women from the services, I do not have an impairment secondary to an injury from a jump, from an aircraft, a parachute jump. Lieutenant Mazik does. She propels through space using a wheelchair march. But in, in microgravity, we have no functional differences. And that's an amazing thing to contemplate. So I want that to be our first moment. Space eliminates some disabilities while at the same time creating others. So I'm not going to play this video due to lack of time, but I want you to know that this is an astronaut who has just returned from 180 days on the ISS. It's a picture of this astronaut standing in a room surrounded by people. He's wearing a camera in the middle of his head. He has his arms crossed. And he's about to be asked to do something that most of us would, who have two propelled with two legs would consider to be fairly standard. We would like him to close his eyes and walk. That's it. Close his eyes and propel forward in a straight line. After 180 days in space, he cannot do this is not a possible task for him due to physiologic and functional changes, right? So he has a standard structure and normally a standard function, but space has created some impairments, taken a person who has no impairments and created a functional change in the way they navigate space. So that's our moment number two. While space takes away some disabilities, some you know, seeming disabilities with the environment, it also can create some disabilities in the environment with people who have no impairments at baseline. Which brings us to the real topic at hand when it comes to microgravity exposure. What are the occupational risks? What are we doing to ourselves, whatever our level of function to go into microgravity? We're exposing ourselves to the risks of changes in mobility due to changes in joint and limb positioning, doing, due to having a slightly bent over spine because why would it be straight? There's, there's no gravity to function against. Visual changes, Mark uh, made a reference to that. Optic disc edema, globe flattening, um, other issues with the retina where it becomes a gorge with too much blood, probably because of those caudal or headward shift in fluids. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Proprioception, like that video, like that picture of the astronaut is going to be asked to propel forward with his feet and can't do it in a straight line. He's had changes to his neurovestibular system that were induced by the microgravity environment. He's also had muscle atrophy. Certain kinds of muscle fibers have turned into certain others globally, but even more so in the lower extremities. Of course, he has lower extremities. Not everybody does. Not everyone will be affected by any of these changes the same, including bone loss. The greatest bone loss occurs in the lower extremities of the pelvis, the heel, the calcaneus, the femurs. If you do not have a heel and you do not have a femur, bone loss is going to look potentially very different for you. And so that's my point, is that all of the occupational risks, these expo but the results of the exposures, the exposures are the same, but the risks vary by what you showed up with. And if you look at this very typical picture of somebody in space, and it talks about what the risks are due to space flight, fluid redistribution shrinks the legs. Well, that's only if you have them. Weight-bearing bones and muscles deteriorate, if that's what you came with. Eyes become sensitive to motion. Well, if you use your eyes to, to, to interact with the world, maybe, but if you don't, then that will be a problem. The otoliths in the inner ear change the way they respond to motion in some ways becoming desensitized. Well, that's if you have a functional sensory system, a neurovestibular system that uses otoliths and endolymph, and some things that some people either have but don't use or don't use in the normal way. So health risks into space flight are, are, are taught to us as being this mono, this single thing. But in fact, the health risks that are believed to be inherent to spaceflight don't always apply to people with disabilities. So let's answer this question. We just answered it, right? Who's susceptible to a space-induced impairment, right? Well, the boring sort of road answer is everyone. Everyone is. You go up there, the occupational risk is the same. The more finely tuned and interesting answer is it depends. What did you show up? What was your pre-exposure function and body system like? This slide features four pictures 
a very healthy astronaut being carried, mostly for safety, but also because we're not sure what their function is, out of a spacecraft after a large exposure to space. And the ready is a very healthy person who propels with two legs. She's not being allowed to even try that just after landing on the ground. The other three pictures are of wonderful, or two pictures are of our wonderful para astronauts who have gone up twice with mission astro access, Eric and, Eric and Mary. Uh, Eric uh, propels and always has, as far as I know, using a wheelchair. He has something that affects him and causes contractures or sort of a, a tightness in all of his joint capsules. He does not by himself stand in full gravity. But the second you turn on lunar gravity, he's able to extend without assistance. And I, for the first time in his adult life without assistance in lunar gravity, just extended to his full height almost. And he's able to propel through the space. And then there's Mary. She uh, is, a, is an athlete. She is an engineer. She is a para-astronaut extraordinaire participating in a, a mission in Poland. And she was able to just doff her lower extremity prosthesis in microgravity because you don't need that thing. You can pop it right off and in place, pop on something you might need, another hand, a set of tools, something else. And there's a picture from Star Trek. This is the future we'd like to see. If you were to carry, if an astronaut were to return to full gravity after some partial microgravity exposure, and they propelled via a wheelchair, where well, you would simply, I believe, put them in their wheelchair and they would propel per normal. Not much would have changed. So who is susceptible to space-induced impairments? Well, really it depends who's susceptible to mobility impairments at all. Sometimes you just have to choose the right robot for the right environment. And on the screen, I have a series of, picture, of ambulation devices, some of which come from the rehab world, some of which come from the aerospace world. They all started in the rehab. The X1 wearable exoskeleton, is a lower extremity robot, and it is now extant as part of what we think of as a propulsion system for space. And then you've got all kinds of back and forth between the rehab environment and the space environment. And that's because it's a natural companionship. We need to mobilize in space, it's challenging. We need to mobilize in Earth, it's challenging. Although really, why is it challenging on Earth? Well, it's challenging on Earth because we expect people to have lower extremities and but in space, if you have a foot, what's going to happen is you're going to stop using it to propel, shed all the skin off your feet, and experience that fluid shift of about one liter per lower, full lower extremity. But you, and then you know the atrophy of bone and muscle in that lower extremity. But if you don't, the way Dwayne, who's pictured here in the middle, does not, then you may not experience that. You may not experience that puffy face, that that overloading of fluid in the face that makes you all stuffy and not be able to smell or taste your food much. You might not be as much risk of a formation of blood clots in your veins, in the neck, the way we've detected a couple of astronauts already. Dana, who's featured all the way on the, on the right, was again a congenital amputee. She's not going to experience two liters of fluid shifting into her upper extremities, torso, head, and neck. It just won't happen. So she is much, she and Dwayne and others who propel differently and, and, and have different configurations are going to be less susceptible to bone, skin, and muscle loss. People who navigate the environment with different vision, like the people featured in this picture, who use tactiles and haptic feedback and other things to navigate their environments on Earth, will not care if the lights go out. They will not care if they land in the middle of Kazakhstan and it's all dark. They will simply navigate their environment per usual. Will we even bother to monitor for changes to their retinas, for changes to uh, any sort of intracranial pressure? We probably will. But changes to their pressure will create diopter change. It needs to wear new glasses or glasses for the first time, either temporarily or permanently, as has been the case in some astronauts. And space adaptation sickness. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but for the first few days of flight, we often don't see people on camera. That's often because they're in the corner being sick. That usually passes with time, not always, but often. Those vestibular changes may not happen at all to people who don't have a typical, or what I call first standard deviation, sort of vestibular system. In the middle are pictures of people who have who were part of the deaf crew, Mission Astro Access, Mission 2. And they're they're practicing communicating in different ways. Light flashes, ASL, they flip each other upside down. And you can still communicate in ASL. The crew cabin environment can be louder than any person can hear through. And they're still communicating just fine. The comms can go down. They're communicating just fine. And by the way, the light signaling that we were using for this crew became invaluable for the entire crew as they're communicating by ASL, medical operations very quickly realized it's a great form of communication. We 
can talk across a cabin environment. The last picture on the right is the fellow um, crew. These crew were uh, deaf to begin with, and they were recruited basically because it was thought these people won't be susceptible to space adaptation signals that we've never tested. But we believe that they wouldn't do that because their systems just don't function like that. Okay, so functional changes in the microgravity environment due to exposure will vary between high-performing populations with and without pre-space flight disabilities. Some people with pre-space flight disabilities will lose their disability, and some people without pre-space flight disabilities will gain them. It's all a matter of what you started with. How did you previously sense? What organic limbs did you have? Before the last Astrox flight, I told everyone, if you have a median nerve, we will offer you a median nerve stimulator for space adaptation sickness, if you get it. Not everyone on the flight had a median nerve. Not everyone on that flight gets space adaptation sickness. That's just the way it goes. All about the risks that you are susceptible to depend on what you show up with. This picture is a picture of Dana's arms. She called me the morning of the first flight and said, Doc, I broke my arm. I said, okay, did you break a cable, a rivet, or a strap? Either way, I can fix it, no problem, but I need to know what component to get out of the toolbox. What would you break? If that call were about a human with organic limbs, it would have been a very different conversation. But I don't worry about Dana's arms. She can bring extra. We can fix them. In flight, before flight, after flight. We can change out the tools that she uses to navigate the space. It's amazing. Which brings us to bioastronautics inclusion moment number three. This environment in microgravity, we created it. It doesn't exist without us. We put it. And if we put it there, then we're responsible for it. We built it. We built the way that people can use it or cannot use it. Inclusion moment number four, my friends, how we design our society turns impairments into disabilities. It's a tough pill to swallow. All those stairs that we put everywhere, they're not useful to a huge, no, huge percentage of the population on a day to day. And I don't just mean people who propel with wheelchairs. I mean people who are toting a heavy load, carrying luggage, gravidly pregnant, have several children in their arms. Those stairs aren't useful to them. Curb cuts, on the other hand, are useful to everybody. The adaptations that we make to the zero G planes in flight, the yoga mats, the extra tethers on the wall, they're useful to every single person on that. There's not a person who doesn't benefit from universal design. So let's design things universally. Let's accept the fact that this environment is an environment that we created. We choose to build it the way that we see it. And the benefit to accepting the responsibility for having built this environment in a way that is not, uh, not friendly to many of the people in the environment is we can unchoose it. We can pre-choose to build a space environment in a way that's accessible to everyone that benefits everyone, whatever your pre-flight level of function was. And we must, I argue that we must for health reasons, because the fact that we have not to date means our current models of health in space, all that we talk about in bioastronautics, as Mark alluded to, is based on a limited studies carried out on that fraction of the population, the white cis male fighter pilot fraction of the population is what we have our models in human space largely based on. To date, we have intentionally excluded 12%, more than 12% of the population, but certainly the percentage that has disabilities intentionally, which means our model of human health in space is incomplete. Now that's changing. It's changing with the para-astronaut project out of ESA. They've decided to include people with lower limb deficiencies. They, like Dr. McFall, who's a new para-astronaut, they've decided to allow a pronounced leg length difference in a short stature. But were these conditions ever relevant to spaceflight in the first place? I'm a doctor for these people. I'm not entirely sure. Because as far as I can tell, the difference between astronauts and para-astronauts largely comes down to the assumptions that we make about their function. And our own personal willingness to modify the operational environment to support the function of whoever, whether or not you're a person with disabilities. And how we define or are open to or not open to redefining what optimal function is before, during, and after space. It's about us, the people building the environment and what we're willing to do or not do. So I leave you with these thoughts. Impairment may be yeah. intrinsic. We may be born with it, we may acquire it during our lives. Yeah. The disability community is the only population you can enter at any time. And if you stick around long enough on earth, then you probably will. You can also sometimes exit from it. But one way or the other, the impairments may have come from you or something that happened to you. But the disability itself often comes and the way that we built the 
the space around us. So we can and should build space for all here on earth and in space. Thank you all so much. Please remember, para-astronauts are astronauts, people with disabilities are people. And I look forward to your thoughtful questions. That's fantastic. So I'm gonna take the liberty of engaging with you with a couple of questions, and then we'll turn it over to Sarah for her presentation. You started with, you started out by talking about, uh, about some of the terminology that's involved. And this is a kind of an eye opener to me because it has, it, it, Taking seriously the terminology has, has kind of changed the way that I perceive some of the issues that you're talking about. Uh, do you, in your clinical practice, do you find that people's attitudes, their care for the disabled is altered by being introduced to the right terminology? I mean, does, does terminology change perception? It does. I mean, in the same way that the way that you define a problem dictates how you address that problem, right? So is the problem the fact that the person propels with a wheelchair, or is a problem the fact that we have failed to ensure that the lift is working properly? You know, what's the problem? And if you say, well, that we have to make accommodations for this person because they have a handicap. It's like, well, you have an expected function of them that they're not able to fulfill, but why? What is your expectation? What is that function? And what resources have we given them to fulfill it? Let's back all the way up. What is their actual impairment? What is your actual expectation? What is the actual environment? So if I ask people to think about the components of disability, which are the impairments, the resources, and the environments, people stop usually using the word handicapped altogether, unless they're talking about a placard. Yeah. And then they start saying, okay, the person's impairment is they don't propel through the community with their low extremities. I'm like, okay, well, are they, what kind of propulsion do they prefer to use? Can they, what do they need to use to meet your expectations? Well, what are your, are your expectations reasonable? Can they be altered? Because if your expectations alter, then maybe their function is entirely unlimited. And then what resources can we provide them? Well, we provide them with enough resources. Again, their function is high, if not highly adapted, possibly unlimited. So when you ask people to think about the components of disability, then uh, things often change kind of that. Yeah, your, your depiction of it, very clear that it's the things that we call a handicap, a handicap is, is because we made it a handicap by designing the environment in a certain way. That to me, it sounds so obvious and clear when you put it that way, but I never thought about it that way. It's something that we impose. So this distinction between impairment, disability, and handicap, I think that's that's a real important takeaway message. Let me ask you one other thing to see if you have any thoughts about this. First, first of all, I'll comment and say, I'm really intrigued being a sensory motor neurovestibular researcher when I when I am not acting as a minor internet celebrity. Um, this that as that aspect really intrigued me uh, of flying people. Of course, there's the Gallaudet study uh, of people with deafness and vestibular problems decades ago with this idea. And it's it's generally accepted in this field that if you do not have an intact vestibular system, you will not experience motion sickness. So boy, that leads right to a put potential study. Let's put those people into space, parabolic flight, suborbital flight, whatever, and see if that really is true in a space flight setting. That's not my question though. That's just a comment. Question I have, you were you're also talking about people with communication disorders or communication disabilities. I'm wondering about the viability of signing of ASL in a zero gravity environment in which the signer and the recipient, the, the observer, may be in different orientations relative to each other. Would that present a problem? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. And I think that was studied in the Gallaudet at 11, uh, to whom you alluded back in the, in the 1950s. And these were all you know, men who were being tested by the U.S. Naval Aviation Medical School. Um, so I, I will not speak to, to that study in particular, but into our own astro studies, they intentionally inverted people who were signing to each other, put them in all sorts of, of, of spatial orientations relative to each other. I mean, each person has these three degrees of freedom. 
and each other person. So you put them together and you have multiplied the degrees of freedom in which this communication could be happening. But, you know, people who relapse, they can communicate. Turned out people who sign to each other, even when they're inverted, the signing is perfectly functional. We have a wonderful ASA interpreter, Justin, who I hope is on this call or gets to see it sometime. He's flown many times and he signs in all sorts of facial configurations relative to people and, and is thoroughly understood. But, you know, more to the point, communication is hard. Communication is hard on the best of days for the best of people in that zero G flight environment of the, uh, you know, sort of uninsulated 757 stripped down American Airlines, uh, you know, vessel with giant engines roaring and kicking in and out of parabolas. People are trying to communicate by yelling into bullhorns. The bullhorn is at the, the, the rear of the plane. And a lot of the uh, research is happening at the front of the plane. So are we hearing that person with the bullhorn? Rarely. <laughs> Rarely. We can see when they put the bullhorn up, but that's often about it. On the other hand, we can see sign language way all the way across the cabin. And we can see the flashing lights all the way across the cabin or feel vibrational haptics anywhere in the cabin even if it goes pitch black or upside down or under something. So having there be redundancy in our communications that is non-auditory and non-visual, just having there be three layers of communication, one that's tactile, one that's visual, one that's auditory, simply ensures your communication will happen. You don't even have to have adaptive crew members or people with disabilities on board. It's simply putting into practice the, uh, the space adage that, uh, that redundancy is key if you want to have a successful mission. That's a great. That's a great answer. I I love that. So and and I'll point out that it's uh, it's not just uh, people who may have a communication disorder or deficit that would be impacted by strange relative orientations in space or other space flight effects. So you can imagine if you're trying to do lip reading or glean someone's emotional state from their facial configuration, whether they're grimacing or whatever that's going to potentially could be impacted by fluid shift. So if you've ever seen pictures of astronauts with significant fluid shift, the face gets kind of bloated and who knows if that would be impaired. And that's not, that's not people with any kind of communication disorder. That's just, that's just people. So this is, uh, this is on a continuum, uh, potentially on a continuum. So everybody could be affected in some way. Everyone is affected in some way space. It's just that non-hearers, and incidentally, deaf people often consider themselves not disabled. They're just non-hearers. They don't communicate. They don't. They do not take in information orally. Okay, that's well taken. But right. um, you know, you know, everyone is affected by the space flight environment. You know, so far, you know, your sinus is filled with fluid. You get headaches, backaches, sleep issues. But as the as the wonderful Michelle Hong Chan, who I think is on this call, once pointed out to me. The same thing that the para-astronauts or astronauts with disabilities are concerned about is the same thing that everyone's concerned about in space flight, peeing, pooping, and puking. Now, these are human concerns. So the human concerns apply. We may have different approaches to management, but we have a different approach to management for every different human. Every different human needs a little something different when they go to space for their peeing, puking, and pooping management. All right, so they need something very different. If you use a catheter, very different. On the other hand, you don't need a space toilet. So there you go. Very good. All right. Excellent. Thank you. I'll take this uh, opportunity to remind people that they can put their questions into the chat se uh, section on the uh, on the Zoom online, and uh, Dr. Sarma will moderate those a little bit later. Now. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Sarah Husnane for her presentation. All right, let me go ahead and share my slides. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sada Husnane. I'll start with a visual description. I am very colorful. I'm a Desi person with long, dark hair and a side part. I've got some rainbow highlights, one on each side. I'm wearing glasses in a rainbow colorway. The gradient starts from the left all the way to the right. Uh, wearing neon green eyeliner and uh, little earrings that are two-tone metal. They look like Saturn, very fun, very spacey. And my Zoom background is digital art of the solar system, these purple sort of sunset -y hues and image credit uh, to NASA. Uh, my talk is titled Dynamic Disability and Human Spaceflight, Intersections and Opportunities for Space Earth Translational Innovation. And uh, just to start off uh, with a bio of myself, especially as it relates to this talk, 
Uh, I hold many roles among them. I'm an engineer, I'm a project manager, I'm an innovation program coordinator at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Day to day, I work on a variety of projects, uh, primarily uh, supporting space missions. Uh, I currently support the Dragonfly mission, which will explore the surface of Titan. Uh, in the past, I've supported DART, uh, which is the world's first asteroid planetary defense mission, as well as OSIRIS-REx, which had a big moment just the other day of asteroid sample return. And uh, a lot of my work focuses on mission planning. So deciding, uh, navigating those spaces of uh, what are we doing? When are we doing it? How are we doing it? What resources uh, do they take? And what are the uh, different knobs we can turn uh, to, to optimize our goals for space flight? Uh, and I uh, provide that for the Dragonfly mission. I'm also in the process of developing user interface to, uh, to support that sort of uh, modeling and uh, data visualization. I uh, support uh, science operations that can look like a variety of data pipelines, very software based. Uh, and on the more programmatic uh, visioning side, I also support straight, uh, space strategy uh, at the sector level, as well as specifically in terms of uh, lunar innovation. Uh, lastly, I founded and lead the Human Spaceflight Innovation Network at the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Uh, we're a little over 150 people of uh, folks with a w wide array of expertise, not necessarily folks who are in space exploration, all sorts of career stages, but people who are curious about human spaceflight, getting involved with space research, applying their knowledge of terrestrial systems to space and vice versa. And my educational background formally is in physics, pulsar astrophysics. I, I've also studied tech stewardship, which is a lot of uh, where do we want to steer technology, integrating values, understanding stakeholder ethics, and things like that. And I'm currently pursuing graduate studies in systems engineering with a focus in his, uh, human systems at JHU. And uh, I like that as a as a bridge between you know my formal space background with learning more about the intricacies of uh, human systems engineering, you know, to support uh, you know long term goals and getting more involved with human spaceflight. Uh, I have a, a image of myself in the top right corner uh, that maps very, very uh, similarly to my earlier visual description. And on the bottom, I have uh, some logos or graphic identifiers of different projects that I've been a part of. So the NASA International Space Apps Challenge, it's actually how I got my start in space. I fully intended on being a biomedical engineer, had never considered a career in space, and many years ago attended uh, the NASA Space Apps Challenge, had great success there, and I've been in space ever since. Uh, the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium, where I lead some efforts in dust mitigation, excavation and construction, autonomy in the lunar surface, the Dragonfly mission, as well as Open XNAV. And XNAV stands for Pulsar Based Autonomous Navigation. And we go ahead and get started with my talk. So, just uh, to highlight disability globally uh, by the numbers. Uh, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S. estimates that about one in four, about 27 percent of adults in the U.S. have a disability. The World Health Organization, so speaking globally, estimates about one in six of the global population experiences uh, what they define as significant disability. Uh, I have an image uh, towards the bottom. It was too, uh, too large, so I split it into two sections of this infographic. Uh, on the left, uh, in uh, dark blue text over a light gray background, disability impacts all of us, and the us is capitalized, so potentially also nodding to the fact that this is also in the U.S. Maybe maybe that's an intention there. Um, and a variety of uh, folks with different disabilities, different mobility aids, uh, talking with each other with the terms communities, health, uh, and access together. And on the right side, uh, up to one in four adults in the U.S. having some type of disability with a map of the U.S. There's uh, uh, a pattern of uh, just a generic uh, image of a person. Some of them are blue, some of them are uh, sort of a deep brassy gold, and those uh, represent folks with disabilities for, versus non-disabled folks in the U.S. And while I'm on this slide, it's important to keep in mind that there are many barriers to identifying as disabled. This could be cost barriers, not having insurance, uh, having a lack of specialists in your area to the more cultural identity, community sort of narratives around disability. So many people may experience disability or chronic illness, but might not identify uh, with that term personally. So I just wanted to include that while we're still on this slide. And dynamic disability. What is dynamic disability? Uh, this term uh, was originally developed by Brianne Bennis, uh, who is uh, the host of a podcast called No End in Sight that focuses on disability. Uh, it can mean a lot of things. And, uh, you know, as a 
sort of consistent definition, uh, you know, a type or severity of your symptoms may fluctuate, they may recur, they may progress over time. Each person experiences the same disability differently. Uh, just giving a couple of examples, there's many, many ways that dynamic disability manifests in people, but just to give a handful of, you know, uh, reference frames for how dynamic disability may manifest on earth, this might be someone utilizing a uh, mobility aid. So that could be a cane, a wheelchair, crutches, a rollator, braces, finger splints, compression gear, et cetera, on some days or in some moments, but not others. Uh, you may be a user of multiple assistive technologies and you utilize specific ones depending on the context of the current activity and the access resources that are made available. Uh, this could be symptoms that are flaring in response to physical or cognitive exertion, uh, for instance, post-exertional malaise or PEM, uh, post-exertional symptom exacerbation or PESE. Uh, environmental factors, maybe barometric pressure changes, maybe uh, chemical sensitivities. So depending on what's in your environment flaring uh, your symptoms, this could also mean having comorbidities or multiple conditions at the same time. So perhaps they're interrelated. Uh, so when one flares, the other one flares, perhaps they are uh, necessarily uh, interdependent and you've got two different conditions on their own sort of sequence, on their own cadence, and they flare at different times or maybe at the same time. Uh, so that's just a high level introduction to dynamic disability and what that might look like. So uh, for the rest of my talk, I'd like to explore what might dynamic disability look like and how might it intersect with human spaceflight and bioastronautics research. So small end data. Uh, while other types of space research may uh, experience the, both the challenges and the opportunities associated with big data, you know, think of heliophysics or, you know, sun physics, it, the problems that they're navigating are often, we have so much data, what do we do with it? How do we select what to bring down? There's just too much data to manage. And we often have a little bit of an inverse problem in the world of bioastronautics, which is uh, small end data sets, not having enough data or not having tons of data to work with. So existing space health data is, has known constraints in regards to volume, so the sheer amount that exists in the world uh, in terms of access, which I'll touch on in a moment, as well as diversity as has been brought up uh, by Mark and Shana, just the, the types of folks who have uh, gone to space before and who have had those opportunities afforded to them. So the term access in this context holds multiple meanings, right? This could mean data privacy and security. This is health data we're talking about. So it's not exactly something you might just go and Google and find, right? Uh, data ownership, sharing, and permissions. So if uh, there's uh, multiple organizations supporting a space mission and uh, a subcontractor owned uh, the pieces to one experiment, perhaps not all organizations have access to that data or agreements need to be prepared or there's more of those uh, inter-organizational aspects of the data that technically exists, but not everyone might have access to. Uh, there's also access in terms of uh, what people might consider web accessibility, the formatting of your data, the user experience of the portals that hosts and actually folks interface with that data, um, as well as screen reader compatibility. So actual you know, web accessibility, how you're actually interacting with the data. So uh, there's already so much uh, limitation in the data available in this domain. So it's important to be mindful when you're conducting bioastronautics research to consider dynamic disability, to consider that there might be multiple conditions flaring at the same time, or that different people need different things on different days. Uh, when you're collecting data, when you are interpreting data, and when you're leveraging data fusion, so data taking data from multiple sources in multiple contexts and uh, using that to aid your analysis. Uh, mission planning and operations. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I stated earlier, a lot of how I spend my days talking and thinking deeply about mission planning, what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, what resources are needed. So space missions are in many, many ways endeavors of optimization to levels that we just simply don't experience on Earth. Uh, this can be of power, of time, of data, of oxygen, of other very critical and very finite resources and dynamic disability intersects with every facet of life and therefore every facet of a human spaceflight effort. So just thinking from the lens of mission planning and resource allocation, some questions that you know I might consider if I were uh, involved in the mission planning team of a human spaceflight effort is how is dynamic disability incorporated into mission activity planning? What scenarios are you thinking of? What scenarios are modeled? What scenarios are prioritized? Uh, in terms of what you're doing, when you're doing, how it's uh, happening, what data is collected, uh, when you've got such incredible limitations uh, on every front. 
Uh, and how might the approach to a mission adapt as disability changes, as disability develops among the crew and maybe among, uh, you know, your mission operations folks who are ground based uh, as well? How might your approach to your mission change in regards to disability as a human factor among everyone involved with the spaceflight effort, especially during long duration spaceflight, uh, which has not happened as much. We don't has, have as much of an archive to, to lean on in terms of uh, how things have been done before. So these are critical aspects to making spaceflight possible. Next, I think a lot about analog astronautics as a catalyst. Uh, Shana had mentioned simulated missions, uh, otherwise known as analog missions. These are uh, simulated activities facilitated in locations that model similarities to extreme environments in space. And this, they can take place in a variety of locations. These might be underwater, these might be in the Arctic, these might be in the desert, different locations on Earth, maybe within a habitat, maybe not, maybe an extra vehicular activity or an EVA being modeled. Uh, so I, I think a lot about analogs as a hub, both physically as a hub, a place you go, but also conceptually uh, for testing, interfacing and catalyzing both terrestrial and space innovation. Um, so analogs offer the capacity to uh, pilot prototype accessibility technologies, like perhaps what we see on the parabolic flights uh, that Shana was mentioning, but as well as your processes and your evaluation methods for understanding disability, uh, you know, during these simulated activities. Of particular note, uh, it's essential to not only consider the accessibility of participating in the ex uh, experiments during an analog mission, but how you actually get there in the first place, right? If these uh, analog activities are taking place in extreme environments like the desert, underwater, the Arctic, and just thinking about how inaccessible transportation is on a day-to-day -day basis when you're doing more nominal activities, going to the grocery store, going to work, going to school, et cetera. Um, it's, it's very important to think about how your, uh, how your crew are going to get there in the first place and to uh, shed some light on a very common <laughs> issue in the disability community as damage to wheelchairs when uh, using using airplanes. You know, airlines were in the U.S. Uh, required to start reporting the number of lost or damaged wheelchairs and scooters at the end of 2018. And just in that first year in 2019, that first full year of reporting, over 10,000 wheelchairs and scooters lost, damaged, delayed, stolen. Uh, per the Washington Post, about 29 incidents a day, and the number hasn't gotten much better over the years. So folks experience this on a daily basis for flights for a variety of reasons. So how might we uh, consider that when engaging in analog astronautics, and how might we we create better ways <laughs> to, to transport people? Uh, you know, could we use this as an opportunity to reflect and, and create better processes for transporting disabled folks? And I do have an image on the bottom right corner, the image credit is to the Lunaris group. Uh, we've got a person on the left side uh, wearing an orange uh, flight suit, person on the right uh, wearing a blue, a dark blue uh, suit. They're both wearing helmets with some illumination going on. Uh, the person on the right is holding what I believe is a shovel, but the bottom is cut off, so it looks like a cane, and I like how that <laughs> plays into the theme of this, of this talk, so I wanted to include that. All right, and heading to the next slide. So one of uh, one of the topics that I think about a lot is space earth translational innovation. Um, notice that there is not an arrow from space to earth and that is intentional. How do we, how do we uh, use what we develop in space to support efforts on earth and vice versa as well? Um, a couple of areas of impact that stand out to me are understanding the dimensions of dynamic disability beyond just a snapshot in time. So that one time you go and are lucky enough to have that 10 to 15 minutes to talk to a doctor, uh, you know, the pain scale that you're uh, writing on a piece of paper in the waiting room, uh, you know, can we, can we grow beyond that? Can we grow beyond that one time snapshot, one to 10 self-reported pain scale? Are there other ways and models uh, that we can develop and operationalize both on earth and in space for interpreting and understanding complex illness over time. Uh, the development of resource efficient assistive technologies and components of the assistive technologies, as I spoke about earlier, power, mass, materials, ergonomics, they limit the utility of uh, and the, just the capability of doing activities in space and also on earth as well. So can we, you know, make uh, mobility aids with, uh, you know, longer term batteries that don't have to be charged as often, lighter or stronger materials and more ergonomic systems, as well as are there opportunities to, to lend ourselves uh, across both of these use cases. 
uh, the last two, applying knowledge of one condition towards the understanding or identification of another. That's incredibly critical on Earth and in space, as I spoke about. We have small end data. We don't have a lot of data that's ever been uh, collected in regards to space flight. So as we lean towards more long duration human space flight, we encounter newer conditions or newer manifestations of illness and disability that we haven't encountered before, we're gonna lean on the knowledge of what we have in the past. And uh, that can lend itself well to under-researched conditions on earth, uh, to small end data, uh, to differential and process of exclusion diagnoses. So sometimes on earth, when you have complex illness, uh, there isn't one biomarker, one test, one uh, you know scan or x-ray that can uh, help you identify uh, what the condition you're navigating is. You you do a variety of them. You do some blood tests and some panels and see what happens. You try one intervention for a little bit and you see what happens. We might not always have uh, the time, the resources uh, to do that uh, in space. So how do we navigate those, uh, those differential diagnoses and those process of exclusion diagnoses that can take years or maybe even a lifetime uh, if you ever get a, a, a formal diagnosis? Uh, medically. The last one I have listed is investment in and impact of patient researchers. So those with lived experience as the experts who advance research in their field. Uh, historically, we've got people studying disability as a, as a concept, um, but folks who don't experience that disability themselves as the drivers, as the authors, as the, as the subject matter experts uh, of that condition. So, you know, might we switch to more of a patient researcher model as more folks uh, explore space? Therefore, are the patients who are also the researchers who are the experts on those experiences. Um, in regards to those last points in particular, something that I've been particularly curious about is the impact of COVID on near-term and future astronauts. There's been some research in the past on viral reactivation during spaceflight. Um, but I haven't heard anything in regards to specifically COVID, long COVID, post-COVID conditions. And there's strong communities on Earth, especially driven by patients uh, in the long COVID communities in myalgic encephalomyelitis or ME communities driving and championing for research on Earth. So I'm very personally interested in the translational innovation in this space, just given the sheer volume of impact that it has uh, on Earth and potentially in space. So if anyone is uh, doing research on that intersection, long COVID and space flight, or you're interested in that, I would love to connect personally and hear about what you're working on. And to close out, uh, as I was developing some closing thoughts for this talk, I came across this newly released report from NASA, just came out a couple days ago. Uh, this is titled Artemis Ethics in Society, Synthesis from a Workshop. And uh, the text bolding and color changing was added by me for some impact. And the quote uh, by Dr. Sherry Wells Jensen, which is referencing, had spoken about the ethical and practical necessity to reconsider the definition of, quote, the right stuff for future astronauts. Various research, engineering, and programmatic communities have a role to play. Dis disabled people in space missions should not be viewed as a risk, and any astronaut could be injured on a mission and become disabled. Um, and in the top right corner, we've got the logo for the uh, NASA office that released this report, which is the OTPS, the Office of Technology, Policy, and Strategy. We've got a light blue to dark blue gradient um, in a NASA worm sort of uh, font style uh, of the OTPS logo. And uh, that's where I'll end. And I'll uh, very curious to hear your questions and uh, as, we, as we regroup as a cohort of speakers. Sarah, thank you very much. That was great. <clears throat> Raises a lot of issues in my mind. I'm just, I'm gonna limit to my, my question now to just one, to one thing, see if you have a, a comment on it because you, one of the things that's really uh, a, a very big issue to me, with matter of fact, we had a whole we had a whole symposium on uh, statistical issues in biomedical spaceflight, biomedical research, and that's the small end question. So let me first of all say, I think I'm starting to see a theme develop here already, which is that rather than seeing the disabled in space as a, as a singularity, an outlier, in a sense, it's a continuum. So instead of saying, because I would be tempted to say initially without thinking it through, well, somebody's going to come up to SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic someday with uh, an implanted deep brain stimulator or a neuromuscular disease of some sort, and they're going to want to fly into space. 
how many people how many people like that are are there are we likely to fly into space for the foreseeable future not very many so you talk about small n but especially that first person what do you do to make it viable so that you do your due diligence and make sure that first individual at that particular deficit is not exposed to undue risk so again i'm putting i'm trying to couch that into the 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 rising realization among the biomedical space flight biomedical community that all of this should be n of one research we're seeing more omics related research personalized or precision medicine and countermeasures the idea of population studies has always kind of bothered me in space flight anyway there are some things that are some trends that are population based but so many things are come down to individual variability. It's a huge problem in spaceflight. Now, I don't know if there's a question in there somewhere of what I just said, but, I, but I'll invite you to comment on that. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like you're inspired. <laughs> Uh, I would say, you know, to my earliest point about you know, just statistics in the U.S. of people with disabilities, that one in four, do you know more that there, there's four people on this call? There's more than four people on this, uh, you know, in this meeting in our audience today. Disabled people are everywhere. Um, so I would, uh, you know, implore you, uh, you in the space flight community more broadly to, you know, think out loud about uh, what disability inclusion might look like and not treating it as an outlier, but it, disability is society. Um, so if you are to have people, you know, go into space, then you are to have disabled people go into space. And, uh, you know, that draws itself to, a, you know, much larger conversation, as you say, on how do we balance the need for generalizability with uh, the specific needs of each individual? How do we develop, you know, this comes up a lot in my um, lunar construction work, honestly, not actually, you know, about construction of habitats, but of uh, you know, a variety of different tools and the automation of uh, construction uh, in space on how do we increase uh, modularity so that we can swap out components as needed? How do we how do we actually develop, you know, whether it's suits, whether it's, uh, you know, instruments that are used for research, whether it is the habitats themselves, um, a, you know, a variety of activities that we're going to be doing. How do we not only develop them with modularity in mind so that we can swap out components as needed, but what does uh, maintenance and repair look like? Uh, over time as well. So it, it lends itself, you know, both to a functional need as well as this uh, need for customization or need to, to support the individual in this, as uh, as you said before, this one person spaceship or this, you know, spacesuit uh, that they will be donning. Yeah, and I'll, kind of on the same theme, I like that you mentioned at one point the, how do you accommodate or take into account uh, the changes in physical capabilities of the crew, even if they don't start out with disabilities of some sort. So again, putting things on a continuum and thinking that this, we shouldn't think, be thinking of these people as outliers. It's just getting us to think more broadly about the entire spectrum of people who go into space, including those with disabilities that are not yet defined or that we don't know about or are hidden in some yeah. way. Identity is a huge part of it. People becoming disabled or identifying as disabled who may not have before. Um, and what does that look like, you know, for the philosophy of disability, for the many models of disability, as you said, you know, it's uh, learning about this for the time, first time or getting a lot of language. I, I hope uh, if there's bandwidth uh, during uh, Bonnie's time to speak, if there is some conversation around the multiple models of disability, whether that's medical, social, rights-based models, there's many different models uh, of disability. So what what might it look like enabled by space, I think is uh, from a philosophical perspective, very, very interesting to, uh, to grow into. Great. So we're going to get to Bonnie in just a minute. But first, Shana, you are, I, you're express, I see you are in violent agreement with a, a lot of of what Sarah has been saying. Did you want to make any comments or 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 on anything that she said now before we go in, in about 10 minutes or so, we'll go to a, a, all three speakers talking together? I, you know, I think really it just comes down to what questions do people have about the fact that function is a spectrum? And every person, every human is functioning somewhere on the spectrum of possible human function on a daily basis, but where they where they are in the spectrum shifts for them as an individual and in relation to what society expects of them. So 
after 366 days in a space simulation, I was still a person, supposedly a high functioning one, but I needed to go home and sleep for a couple of weeks. I was not able to keep working as a physician anymore. I've just been on call for a year. I needed to tap out. And, you know, after an astronaut has been in a Mars transit for nine months, where are they in terms of their function? What are we expecting of them? It's going to shift. And then after they make landfall, hopefully they don't get hurt and haven't had a ton of osteopenia and muscle loss on the way. And they can stand when they land. What do we expect of them in terms of function? Will be different than what we expect of them in terms of function two weeks later, two months later. We're constantly making accommodations of all functional things. So let's just think about things in terms of function and what accommodations we need to make for people to achieve the maximum function for a given environment. Yeah. I, I love it. I, the idea of just making the box bigger and 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 thinking about it in, into the into the corners of it. That's great, Sarah. Thank you. That was great. So now we'll hear from our third speaker, uh, Bodinglin Swinor. So I was going to start out by at, asking you to tell us a little bit about the Disability Health Research Center in Hopkins and how you think it might, what you do, and how you think it might relate to some of the topics that you've heard here. You don't have to answer that question. You can talk about anything you want. Well, thank you. Um, I'll start with my visual description. Um, I am a middle-aged white woman with shoulder length blonde hair wearing um, a dark top sitting in my my office here in Baltimore. And just first by expressing my, my thanks for being included in this conversation and to my co-panelists. Um, yeah, I am the founder and director of the Disability Health Research Center at Hopkins. Um, admittedly, not an expert on space or space flight, but the the center we are focused on advancing equity, largely health equity for people with disabilities, all types of disabilities, and we're focused on using data driven approaches. Our tagline is changing the paradigm from living with a disability to thriving with a disability. So I think, you know, from my perspective in, in participating in this conversation, you know, the work that we do at the center is trying to um, change the way we're even doing research on disability, on people with disabilities. And I think there's some overlap even in how Sarah ended um, um, her discussion in that we believe in our working hard to include more people with disabilities as researchers to be, um, the experts on disability. And there's lots of ways to do that in um, supporting equity and inclusion in higher education and in STEM fields, but also finding strategies to partner with the disability community in the work that we do. We truly do believe disability, people with disabilities are the experts on disability. Um, that's one part. The other focus is on accessibility and the accessibility of data. So I was really excited to also um, listen to, to Sarah talk about that and, and just echo all of the, the great things that was that were discussed. But another aspect of what we do that I think um, could be helpful for this conversation is trying to center the views of disability back onto how people with disabilities view themselves. And there really is an important moment happening right now in the disability community. Um, there's a shift in the social movement of disability. So we have moved from disability rights to disability justice. And there is a important shift to empowerment and disability identity. So there is a move away from this idea that of that framework where disability is something to remove, where disability is something to prevent instead. Disability is a group of people, right? Disability is an identity. And we face inequities and barriers that are created by society. And what I think is exciting about this conversation is what has already been stated is the idea to create a, a society or opportunities in space from the beginning that are more equitable, accessible, and inclusive of people with disabilities based on what we have learned on earth already. And, uh, and I am hopeful that that could, could be possible. And, and um, I think is the, the underpinning of, of, of this discussion. So that's what I hope that um, my insight could be in this conversation. 
Excellent. So let me actually let me ask you a direct, somewhat loaded question. In the disability health, the disability health research center. If you were if you were to get a grant for a common day for for including the a broader population in space, the disabled in space, what would you start out by doing? Good question. Um, this is a good question. Uh, you know, I think the first thing that we always do is we go to the community. What does the community want? I think we need to move away from a framework of what do a bunch of people about disabilities think people with disabilities want? And we need to go back to, like we're learning for other communities, talk to people with disabilities. What would they want? How would they want an experience to be? How would they want disability to be talked about? How would they want people with disabilities to be included? That's always, I think, an important start. And there's diversity in the disability community and you need to work to capture that diversity of perspectives. So that's step one. Um, then from that, I think, you know, the, the two things we always focus on are again, what Sarah talked about, are creating, um, and, and, and Shana also discussed this, universally designed spaces. So working on building, um, um, structures and systems and opportunities to include everyone and or include the most number of people, and that includes people with disabilities. And I, as a data scientist, really believe in the power of data and thinking carefully about how we could collect better data um, to identify their barriers or catalysts to being involved in, in space flight for people with disabilities. And I think that probably would also include ensuring people with disabilities have say in how that data, uh, how those data are being captured and being interpreted. There's a movement um, as well in data spaces to capture disability as a core metric of, dis of demographic information, right? And, and I don't know if that's happening in these spaces, but that really is critical. And that honors the fact that Again, people with disabilities are a community of, of individuals that face barriers and have an identity. Um, but that's just one example of data capture that really needs to be informed by people with disabilities. And then the last thing that I think is always important, and this also was alluded to, is, is giving the data back to the public, to people with disabilities, to also apply interpretation. And certainly there's care involved, there's, um, um, standards of, of ethics and protection of, of health information. But I think as scientists, as researchers, our end goal is often to publish in scientific journals and present at scientific conferences. And we need to move to go beyond that and to take our knowledge and to then share it more, pub more to a, a public audience. And that should be the ultimate goal is, is sharing our information with the communities we serve and, and we're working for. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna open it up to all three of our esteemed speakers and see if anything that anybody said has has hit a nerve uh, or something that could be good, could be bad, uh, something that you would wanna comment on or discuss. In the absence of anything, I, I see Shana moving, yes. Okay, I was going to see if, if, well, but Shana, being in a clinical setting, the, how much does what Bonnie's just said, her last point, resonate with you? The, well, the last two points, I guess, including the actual people who are impacted by the work in the discussions about where it should go, and then giving, making sure that they have something to do with how the data are interpreted and and used to set policy, presumably. I think that's the right of every group of people to understand how their data are being used, to what end, by whom, and to have equal rights to access to that data so they themselves can put it to use that benefits their own outcomes. So that's certainly true for community of people with disabilities, but also people of color, um, genders, don't conform to the gender binary, all peoples, I think, have a right to their own data and metrics so that they can use those things uh, to, to use them. 
Would you say that it's being done adequately or that there's room for improvement? I believe that there is a lot of room for improvement. So I suspect. Okay. We do have audience questions, but I want to make sure that the three speakers, if you have anything to say to each other or uh, have a discussion based on what, you what you've each presented, that I give plenty of time to allow you to do that. Resonated a lot with what uh, Bonnie said. I'm not as familiar uh, with the research network. I've I've heard of it, but I've not been involved yet. Maybe in the future? Question mark. We'll see. Maybe a little cross Hopkins, you know, pollination action going on. Um, yeah, I'm I'm curious. Uh, you know, in your work, do you interface at all with organizations, let's say doctors with disabilities, uh, for instance, where it, often people assume that. Uh, the medical industry is not populated or uh, facilitated by folks who are themselves uh, disabled. I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, what sort of interaction you've had with healthcare workers or uh, researchers who are themselves uh, disabled, just uh, speaking a little bit more about that. Yeah, this is Bonnie, thank you. It's it's funny you say, talk about doctors with disabilities. Uh, Dr. Lisa Meeks at University of Michigan, who has started that Docs with Disabilities initiative is one of my uh, closest friends and colleagues and actually was just texting me as we were on this call. Um, so yeah, um, we work a lot in the space of including people with disabilities in health professions, public health, STEM, um, higher education, all you know professions. I really do believe that um, these are levers that we haven't pulled on to change societal views of disability. These are places where we're learning about systems, bodies, structures, and inform our views of disability. And when we've kept people with disabilities out of these spaces, that is just perpetuating ableist views, uh, stereotypical views of disability. Um, so yeah, I think all of that has interplay in these, this dialogue and in these conversations. Um, diverse teams are really important and ensuring those teams include people from the populations that are being um, studied, examined, worked with is so, so critical. And, and yeah, we have lots of work to do for sure. But I think there is really good traction right now and, and I hope it, it continues and expands. Okay, I'm imminently about to turn it over to Malika because she tells me that we have some very interesting questions. Three, two, one, okay. Malika, it's, your, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, hi everyone, I'm Dr. Malika Sarma. As Mark mentioned, I am uh, his postdoc in this lab. I, while I don't do disability work, I do research on stress. And so I feel like there's a very exciting and interesting overlap right there. Uh, a quick visual description. I am a South Asian woman wearing a black sweater, uh, sitting in my home office. I am surrounded by some exploration art and uh, some plants behind me uh, on this very dreary day in Baltimore. And we have some really great questions from the audience. I know that some of our speakers have to, to head out. So I want to start with a question that I think all three of you will have some really interesting uh, answers to. So uh, from one of our colleagues down in UNC, uh, Don Kernagas uh, talks about a large part of selection now for astronaut selection, for spaceflight selection, is about whether crews can help their crewmates in an emergency scenario. And so this would be mentally, cognitively, physically, and so for the group, what are some thoughts on R&D for streamlining communications, equipment, protocol for handling emergency scenarios across crews with different abilities, which seems to be critical as we're expanding access to space. Crews are relatively dependent on each other for these scenarios. So thinking about developing modular equipment, which Sara, I believe that you mentioned, for rescue and emergency management, but also communications that are effective and time efficient across a spectrum of abilities. This could also potentially make things safer if crews are having uh, ability changes in flight. So thoughts, the floor is open. Is there anyone who has a pressing answer who would like to go first? 
I think, Shana, you might have the pressing answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be lovely if I did. Um, you know, this is, of course, a question that's being answered right now. Um, ingress, egress, and emergency procedures are often brought to the fore when people say, well, you know, you've got a mixed group. You have people who are not professional astronauts of any type. They're civilian astronauts, they're tourists, right? How do they handle the emergency environment? Well, it's, you know, they handle the way they're trained to handle, right? And they're they're trained to what the environment requires of them. So this is where the that universal uh, accessibility and design comes into play. So you know, let's say you're doing a ground landing um, in Kazakhstan or in, in the desert, as Boeing has practiced with their Starliner. And you hit the ground, the lights go out, the comms are dead, you don't know how far rescue is, right? And so you just do what you're trained to do and what the environment allows you to do, right? And so an astronaut who may have, you know, you know, use their lower extremities to propel, uh, who's got some, you know, we, they've been training, you know, they've been doing their three hours a day of rehab in flight. So they're pretty strong. Uh, we'll do, you know, we'll try to get up and walk, you know, ambulate around if they can unlatch themselves. Uh, we've had some situations already with dragon returning where people return and they're inverted and they're simply like, well, we're hanging out here until further order. Yep. Here we are. We're hanging out. So, you know, they, they, first of all, you do what you're, you're told to do. If the comms work, if the comms don't work, you're, you're, doing what you're trained to do. So we have to provide an environment that allows people to function in their assigned capacities and also some redundancy in case that person has decided to uh, syncopize or fall out during the re-entry and they're not able to fulfill their assigned role. You have to be cross-trained to, to cover other roles. So build the environment so that people of all different abilities, shapes and sizes can navigate in a variety of different scenarios. The lights are out, the comms are off, you're inverted um, and you're strapped in, okay, go. And so everyone of every functional level and, and every different sort of human um, you, you know, permutation needs to be able to function in that environment. Okay, so you have to adapt the people and adapt the environment so that anyone can do their job. And that I know that's kind of a vague answer, but it's kind of a vague scenario. You have an emergency, what do you do? Well, what's the emergency? How, how did it come about? What's your crew? What, what do you do? So, you know, designing the environment for sort of maximal modularity, flexibility, and utilization by the maximum number of people is going to maximize your output. So again, Another theme that we see designing for the disabled is designing for everybody. Makes it better for for everybody. Designing for the human population is designing for the human population. Right. There so. you go. Yeah. Right. So, Bonnie, is that is that is that something that that's like an explicit part of the profile that the portfolio that that you do in the center? Yeah, we. Um... Are, are very focused on um, actually collecting data to advance universal design, I would say. And, and Shana was exactly right. It's designing for the population so most people can be involved. You know, I think the example is curb cuts, which are originally designed for wheelchair users, but certainly benefit people's strollers, bikes, rolling suitcases, et cetera. Um, but you know, there's a data collection component to doing that, to seeing if it's really working, if it's not, if it's not working, the environment um, that also probably needs to be considered. And I admit, on Earth, we don't do a great job on that. Um, needs to be improved, and is something to think about as data structures and systems are being built um, for space. Absolutely. Um, the, this whole conversation just is making me reflect on what are the emergency response protocols on Earth for something as simple as there's a fire in your building, evacuate. The response is usually crickets. Good luck. You're on your own? Question mark? Maybe. Uh, so th there's so much work to be uh, to be done. So such great need for emergency response protocol terrestrially in the most common of situations. Uh, so I not only, you know, do I agree with, uh, you know, the uh, points that my other uh, co-panelists are making, but there is, uh, we are ripe for innovation uh, on earth. Uh, we, we do not have emergency evacuation response protocols figured out at all. Um, and especially in regards to um, disabled populations. 
Yeah, so in speaking very broadly, terrestrial space, all sorts of environments, it's the things that you take for granted that are going to come back and, and do you some real harm because you just assume that they're under control or they're not going to go wrong or whatever. So again, I like this idea that having to explicit, forcing you to explicitly address some things because the disabled community requires that particular issue be addressed is not just for them, it benefits everyone. You should have done it anyway. It's just that maybe that's the thing that forces the issue. In many ways, it's a good analogy to, to why we do human exploration of space itself. It's like, okay, well, we do it. Space is the excuse. Right, the humanity is the reason we do it. And okay, if you want to say that the the population of people with disabilities is the excuse for having to make things universally accessible, okay, but humanity is the reason. <laughs> you know, anyone who wants to study this, Bonnie, I, I I I point you as a great analog to the public transit system in New York City. Riding the subway in New York is an exercise in what it means to have the human population attempting to utilize a mode of transit. And everyone from people carrying huge packages to double wide strollers to single wide strollers to oxygen tanks is in the same system and are required to reach out and help their fellow human beings just utilize the system as designed. And so we could redesign the system so everyone could utilize it with equal e efficiency, efficacy, and dignity. We simply have it. So we're looking forward to designing space. The origin is designing their habitat of the people that design theirs. We could design it with efficacy, efficiency, dignity forever, and that would benefit. So that's that's kind of where we're at in space. We have this opportunity now not to have to go back and rebuild a system, but to look forward and build a system the right way. And that would not be something. Yeah, thank you. I, I, lo I love the point that you start. I love, I love the whole thing, but I, the point that you started out with, which is that that we use space as kind of an excuse. But what we're really doing is in an acute form, we're studying the human condition. We're studying what it takes, what it means to be human. Happens to be a small number of people in an extreme environment for now. But in the big picture, what we're really doing is studying humans. So that could be the topic of a whole symposium in the future, and maybe will be. Malika. Yes. Uh, and I think that a common theme that has come up throughout this a seminar is that when studying a disability, we are uh, studying everyone, but also studying in space and studying earth. It's not as different as we think. So Lisa Gethard, one of our participants in the audience mentioned that we have learned lessons from the pandemic where a lack of communication for emergency purposes for public audiences has been discovered. And these communications that we have learned are something that is really important to, you know, thinking of innovation in space, and then maybe going a little further of thinking about specifics of ingress, egress, emergency procedures, etc. So I think reiterating that space research and earth research are not two discrete entities, but are always feeding back to each other is very important. Now, um, Shane, I know you have to leave soon, but there is one specific question that just came up about your work with Astro Access from Scott Rhodes. What are barriers and challenges that Astro Access has met in context to mainstream physical flight requirements and restrictions from organizations such as the FAA? And I guess for the other panelists as well, what challenges do you see coming up in these very entrenched bureaucratic and um, government or industry systems that are meant to be protective and regulatory? Great question. So right now in Washington, D.C., the All Wheels Up Accessibility and Commercial Flight Conference is ongoing. So I'm on the, I'm on, or maybe now <laughs> by default, uh, the head of the medical operations there, but I'm certainly on that panel. I'm on that, that group of people that looks at commercial, commercial travel and commercial air travel is incredibly difficult for many people, but magnifies difficulty for people with disabilities. People who propel by wheelchairs are required to abandon, with very few exceptions, abandon their prescribed wheelchair, their prescribed seating, their prescribed alignment system in favor of an airplane seat, which is designed for some sort of standard human back in the 1970s. 
And for this reason, um, a lot is changing in commercial air travel, including a very recent requirement that all new planes starting in 2027 have accessible bathrooms. This was only a requirement for double aisle aircraft, civilian aircraft, and now will be a requirement for all aircraft operating in, I believe, US airspace. There's a reason for that, right? It's no one doesn't benefit. So right now in operating in Astro Access, you need to be able to provide safe ingress and egress in emergency for all people on board of a zero G flight. I won't speak for zero G, but we're required to do that in medical operations as though in practice, ingress and egress prior to flight and have people be responsible for assisting those who might need assistance, just as you do a standard commercial flight. Those who need assistance, please stay in your seat. You will be assisted. And so we do practice that. Everyone who needs assistance or might need assistance has an assistant. It's no different than a commercial space flight. Though interestingly enough, so far, generally speaking, people with mobility uh, adaptations who use wheelchairs, generally speaking, don't fly on zero G without a without astro access. One bought a ticket recently and then when zero G said, oh, you work with a wheelchair, you know what? Please don't fly until you fly with astro access. It's like, but, but you could, you'd have to just fly with an assistant, right? So part of it is FAA requirement and having there be someone there to assist with safety. Part of it is policy of the airline or carrier, right? So airlines or carriers can make any policy they want to. They could re-engineer their wheelchairs with a wheelchair docking station and do all the necessary testing and engineering to have their be one, which is what All Wheels Up is pushing. They're actually doing crash testing with different wheelchairs and wheelchair docking systems to point out that people should be allowed to bring their own seating systems on a plane. That would be safer and better for everyone. Any airline could do that at any time. The policy up from their end could change at any time. As long as it's minimally aligned with federal standard, they could make it, they could elevate it, shall we say. So that's just, that is up to the airline, to the carrier, and it could be like any, any structure, any, constru any construct. We build, the, the, the built environment is our responsibility. We make it this way. So we could choose to make it a different way at any time. Does that answer the question? Please excuse me, audience, for my clinical duties are calling. Thank you all to my fellow panelists and to Johns Hopkins for having us. I really appreciate you all. Thank you. Everyone else, don't go anywhere. It's just Dr. Gifford, whose clinical duties call. Open the floor to both Sara and Bonnie, if you had any thoughts on um, these uh, entities. Yeah, I. Um, this is Bonnie. I work a lot in science policy, and I think there's um, a structure and framework to think about as these policies are emerging or changing or beginning. And, you know, the way I think about it is a need for community engagement in the policy making process and that's engaging in the research pro research process that we've been describing to support the evidence to develop the policies but also informing the policies right making sure people with lived experience are helping shape them there's also a need for um, transparency and I think some of our conversations about data help with that um, transparency and how those policies are going to be upheld or um, supported. And then accountability, which is, overlaps with transparency, but can be a little bit different. Is there channels when things aren't working? Are there avenues to shift and change or to file grievances in some cases? Um, and unless those are well established and established thoughtfully, you know, sometimes policies can be too blunt and not as um, helpful to as many as, as intended. And so I think in, in thinking about science policy and the structures to, to create them, you know, it's also really important to think through the lens of humanity, like we were talking about, and the, the impacts of, of a diverse group of people. And I think that's also why it's just really critical to have many different perspectives at the table, thinking about all the ways in which the policy could potentially negatively um, have impl implications for those groups. Yeah, I think a huge element to all of this is the normalization uh, and the value of disability in quite literally these spaces. Uh, for instance, you've, uh, you've probably seen the recent reports of, you know, pilots withholding medical information uh, because if 
if they're more transparent than they currently are, they will not be allowed to fly on top of the huge pilot shortages that we're facing, right? Uh, and uh, similarly, astronauts, uh, this, this deeply entangles with people identifying as disabled to understanding that there even is, uh, you know, maybe a, a medical uh, condition that is developed during space flight to how long does it last post flight to are they eligible for another flight in the future? And uh, thinking uh, very critically, right, uh, and uh, ahead of time about uh, the role of, uh, you know, disability identity in decisional practice. Uh, so when you're applying uh, to become an astronaut candidate through the selection criteria of becoming an astronaut candidate, and if or and or when inherently disability develops and changes during space flight, are people eligible uh, for flights in the future? So that's a lot of what's top of mind in terms of um, uh, intersections of uh, policy and also, you know, lessons learned from terrestrial use cases such as in aviation on, uh, you know, how might we reflect on uh, the identification of disability, the disclosure of disability, and, uh, you know, how might that be more more normalized and more valued in, in all of these structures? So I was going to save this question for the end, but I feel like this question is really relevant to this conversation of, of barriers. And my question, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about how important this is. And once you use the right terminology, it becomes almost intuitive and obvious that there is a clear solution here and it, it benefits everyone. Do you think that the issue is that people are just not thinking about it? Like, is it an exposure issue? Is it a language issue? Why is this not more obvious both at the policy level and at the research level. Yeah, I would I would say it's because there's not enough people with disabilities and openly identifying as having disabilities leading uh, scientific spaces like this. And that is so tightly linked to the um, inequities and exclusion that people with disabilities face in society. And that's also tightly linked to that sort of deficit based or that stereotypical view of disability that people can't or people shouldn't, or it's an exception, right? Um, and all of those things I do think really compound to just not being part of the conversation, right? and not thinking this is something to prioritize. It's not part of the vernacular of diversity of efforts in, in science. And that really does have to change, but it's going to take some turning of all those gears, um, maybe some turning harder than others. And I really think it's including more people with disabilities in, in these conversations and in, in these spaces. So I, I really am grateful for this, this discussion for, for that reason and, and to highlight that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of moving parts here. And is there like a, a D, all of the above <laughs> answer here? Um, I I would say there's, a, you know, who who has authority and who has power and who has, uh, who makes decisions uh, is a huge element of this. I think there's also financial logistical barriers to having disabled folks uh, involved in spaceflight, which I don't think has come up yet. But, you know, if uh, let's say you're in the U.S. on disability income benefits, uh, a lot of folks uh, cannot be married uh, or cannot own more than two thousand dollars worth of uh, you know, savings, uh, because then uh, they're uh, they're no longer eligible for their benefits. So th there might be a financial barrier to becoming an astronaut, because if you get $2,001 in salary, you are now kicked off uh, your benefits. It, it might have nothing to do with how you design the habitat and it, all of uh, how the crew decisions were made and all of that. It, it may be a logistical uh, factor that has more to do uh, with policy, with society, with, uh, you know, problems that transcend uh, you know, the the delineation of earth and space that is uh, uh, often perpetuated. Um, so I, I think it requires, uh, as Bonnie has alluded to, you know, more engagement with disabled folks, more investment in disabled folks, uh, having disabled communities lead these efforts. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, those are the great steps forward. Yeah, and again, just drawing on the drawing on the theme, the reason that you the reason that one of the reasons that you would include the disabled in any of these discussions is not 
only because of the disabled population, it's because their input expands the thinking and helps everybody. I like that this keeps coming, that that idea keeps coming around. Yeah, I hear I hear that a lot in all sorts of innovation spaces, right? Oh. Uh, more diverse teams build better solutions, and that is important. And also disabled people are people in society and deserve access to opportunities because they exist. <clears throat> and I think, uh, you know, both are uh, equally, uh, equally important. Absolutely. And speaking of, of diversity, I feel like the intersectionality of disability with other identity groupings is important. So Anna Wolfenberger had a question about um, small n data. And when you're talking about intersectionality, I feel like small n becomes even smaller n. Uh, and her question was thinking about how are the general effects of aging considered for spaceflight and how that aging might intersect with our ideas and thoughts and innovations for disability. So it sounds like small, we need a new field called micro and data, <laughs> right? Uh, for for new, new, new statistical analyses. Uh, so just to make sure I understood the question, it is uh, how is uh, age can factored into who can become an astronaut candidate or not? How age can be thought of in in context with disability. Age and disability as two factors that work on top of each other. Mm, got it. I, I think this is interesting uh, from the perspective of sometimes disability resources are uh, distributed or allocated to, uh, for instance, in the state of Maryland through the Department of Aging, you'll have access to uh, mobility aids, et cetera, from the Center for Aging uh, when people, I guess everyone's aging. I've aged since I started this sentence. So, you know, I guess it depends on uh, the uh, the definition of time and definition of aging that you're using since, uh, you know, we're aging all the time. But if uh, if we're discussing, you know, um, folks who are later in life versus folks who are early in life, who who can or should become an astronaut, who, um, who is considered, uh, you know, applicable to flight. I think those are broader conversations to have. I've seen, uh, you know, as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, uh, having folks as old as 90 uh, participating in space flight. I think, uh, I think there's more data uh, to be captured and more opportunities to be had, but I think it, it speaks to, you know, how do we value older people in society, <laughs> right? How do, how do we value age in society? How do we perceive age in society and who, who has access to what opportunities is, you know, should there be prioritization on folks who may not have more opportunities based on age? You know, how does that factored into the decisions on uh, who, who's eligible for flight? I'm curious if Mark has any thoughts on that, uh, just given your your legacy and wisdom, you know, in this in the space flight field, do you have more context on how age has been considered um, in terms of who goes to flight, who doesn't, or research over time? Well, um, I, I don't have any great insights among professional astronauts, except that there are age limits. NASA sets age, age limits for, for selection. Once selected, I don't actually know if there's a, a hard limit in terms of how old someone can be can fly if they've already that person has already been an astronaut for a number of years and is ex, is ex, has exceeded the age at which they would no longer be selected as an astronaut. But that has to happen all the time. That, that they would break the, the selection limit. Training astronauts is extremely expensive and extremely resource intense. So as long as astronauts are in good health and capable, NASA likes to keep flying them if, if at all possible and if they still want to. So um, I don't know what the, what the rules are. If there's any, like a lot of things related to astronaut training, selection, and especially medical and medically related issues, medical related issues, there's a bit of a cloud over it. A lot of that stuff is just done, kind of done internally. But we have to note, John Glenn flew when he was rather old, you know, the second time that he flew. Uh, there are some other cases, I forget, uh, Bill Thornton was a a physician and an astronaut flew on the shuttle a number of times. I think he may have been the oldest person to fly at the time that he flew, which I think may have been in his 60s, 
maybe early 70s. So there have been some cases, but the reason I'm talking about them is because they are outliers. Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, this idea of who's fit, right, um, transcends many spaces from physician, physicians to, I mean, many spaces. And I think, you know, Mark, what you said, it might take happens all over, which is it's a little cloudy. <laughs> and and part of the reason I think it's cloudy is because to be frank, it's often informed by bias. You know, the idea that older people can't. And and that has ableist undertones to to be honest. It's not data driven often. Um and it's it's complicated, I think. You know, you talked before about, you know, precision medicine approaches, you know, age is more than the chronologic number of how many years you've been alive since birth, right? And the, and people age at different speeds um, biologically on earth uh, and perhaps, you know, even in space, I, I admit, I don't know that. And so there's, there's probably some work to be done even in that space to understand, um, and, you know, implications for human space flight that interweave with um, research in, in aging in general, and then overlaying that again, that humanity, that social, that social concept on top of it and making sure um, we're not applying entrenched bias in interpreting the data. Wonderful. Well, I am certainly in favor of anything that would allow older people to potentially fly into space. So we have a question from actually very early on in the discussion um, from Rahel. How would you think about impairments that might not be classified as disabilities in in the Earth environment or in the spaceflight environment, but things that can still change the lived experience? And so this is thing. These are things that include mild visual impairment like myopia, which we know that a large number of the population has, color blindness. Uh, cognitive impairments like attention deficits or attention differences, learning differences, et cetera. Yeah, sure. Well, I would say that um, some of those those thing, things you listed actually qualify as disabilities on, on Earth <laughs> under the ADA. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think... I, there's some precision in language to think about, right? And how we're talking about disability as an identity or as I think how many people are framing disability as more of functional limitations. And I'm guessing that's what this question is more about is the functional limitation approach. And so if you're talking about myopia, um, yeah, I mean, I think if you're extremely myopic on earth, there's, there's things to consider um, in retinal changes, for example, and, and, eyeball <laughs> physiology in space. Um, but as far as, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's some crosswalk, I guess what I'm trying to say between the function and the disability. And I'm trying to back us away from this idea that disability is completely tightly linked to those things. Um, and it is more of identity and perception and surrounding and dynamic as Sarah described. And so I, I think there's a bit more work and conversation to be had um, in separating those. There certainly is a number of people on earth, perhaps even in space, that would classify as having a disability that don't identify um, and thinking about what that means in their functioning, quite honestly, right? In, in their recognition of you know, how they're um, interacting with their environment around them. And I think that actually is also really important to consider. So I'm not sure I'm, I'm squarely answering that question, but um, I think this conversation is, is a broader discussion. Sarah, I'm sure you have things to like say. You, like you said, a lot of this comes down to identity. Some folks, let's say with ADHD, consider themselves disabled, some don't. As uh, Shana said earlier, some folks who are deaf consider themselves disabled, some don't. Um, and all of those are equally valid approaches to living your life. And, uh, you know, in reflecting on this, it really makes me think who who shouldn't 
go to space who shouldn't be an astronaut like you know whether for logistical reasons or just constraints on you know payload and cost you know why why not <laughs> why not send all those folks to space that's a fantastic uh, answer for both from both of you and i think goes into our final comment and question so uh gary riccio commented in the chat uh, a meta a meta scientific lesson to be learned from the rehab engineering community is how to make a difference without relying on population statistics. So this goes back to our conversation on precision, personalized medicine. Um, this community has always been about individuals continually identifying situated risks and countermeasures. So as we are closing this session, you know, we have talked in depth about variation in disability and how it exists on a continuum and how it's a dynamic process and it's different for different people, identity-based, etc. But what are your thoughts on the potential unknown disabilities as we go into this unknown environment, unknown space, and what would be some suggestions that the both of you might have and Dr. Shellheimer as well um, as we are preparing for these unknowns? I think it comes back around to your relationship to disability within a mission team, within an organization that funds missions, uh, in regards to, you know, communities on earth and taxpayer dollars that go into, you know, funding these efforts potentially. Uh, I think I think it all comes back around to, you know, what is our perception on disability? I, th I think that's exciting. I think I look forward to learning about uh, you know, the new terminology that's created to learning about, you know, as, as I said, you know, this translational innovation of how do we learn about what exists on earth? How do we sort of, uh, you know, reflect on existing conditions, existing data and compare and contrast what we're seeing in spaceflight? You know, how do we, how do we accelerate our understanding and our appreciation of disability on earth and in space? I, I greatly look forward to, to more disability research. Yeah, this is Bonnie. I, that's really, I think, an interesting idea as well is how what happens in space can shift societal views and frameworks of disability on Earth, right? I, I'm always so interested in how science impacts society. And I think that's a great unknown and a really interesting one. Um, but, you know, even from a from a data standpoint, how can we collect data on something we're, we're not sure uh, about what what it will be? I always come back to making sure there's channels and opportunities for input and feedback from the community, from people who are experiencing space flight um, and, and keeping that as a sustainable process. Um, it is hard to fully prepare for the unknown, but as long as you're centering it on those with experience, um, you can get a better sense. And sometimes that's with qualitative work to supplement the quantitative work. And, and just making sure those structures are built in place for what we call at my center, a growth mindset for data um, and realizing it, it can evolve over time, but build those structures to do so. So let me comment on that briefly, it, the because you the word data kept showing up in your answer, Bonnie, which is a, a big one for me because people have heard me say this a number of of times, in my in my view, anytime you send anyone into space, you're performing it. You're performing an experiment, because there have been so few people who have gone into space, fewer than seven hundred in all in all of our history. So, we should be sending them up there with the intent of getting data from them, and not saying, "Okay, it's just a suborbital flight, Earth orbital flight." whatever, it's a short flight, it's a medium term flight. We got that under control, we know what we're doing. If every subject is, if every person is unique, call them a subject, because I think of them as test subjects, um, that applies not only to the disabled, but again, to everybody. So we should be doing this anyway. So that's again, more of the same, right? It's this, it's this continuum. And if we were to say, well, we wanna fly more disabled into space, we have to up our game in terms of the data we get so much the better because it, again, everybody benefits. Space data curve cut. <laughs> did we just coin a term? I think we did. Okay, or, there we go. coming out? No, I'm kidding. <laughs>
So, <laughs> that, and that's a good note to end on. So, Malika, I believe you're tapped out on questions for now, right? That is correct. Okay, excellent. So, perfect timing on everyone's part here. This is fantastic. So, let me let me wind up here by thanking everybody who's involved with this. Uh, Dr. Gifford, of course, I'll get back to her later and thank her individually. Uh, Dr. Husnain, Dr. Sweenor, thank you so much for participating. The presentations were great. The discussion was great. Malika for moderating the questions. Everybody who was involved in the audience submitting questions. The Hopkins at Home team, Aaron Joe, Ari Hero, Linda McLean in the Office of Research Translation, who does a lot of behind the scenes work for us, and the CART and ASL people who apparently have performed flawlessly because I've not heard any griping from, uh, from the Hopkins at Home people. So once again, thanks to everybody uh, for participating, for doing your part. It was great, exceeded expectations on my part, and looking forward to doing the next one in a few months, topic to be determined. Thank you.